Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew, one of the pastors here. Good to see you. Who made it out to Easter camp last week? A few of you? Yes, it was good. Uh, some of you would have experienced Terry Johnson in spinning mode <laughs> in the round. Yeah, that, that looks sort of cool for singing, but as a speaker, I'm like, man, I'm glad I don't have to spin around every week. But there you go. He did well. And Lloyd Grolman, the Big Ten. I hung out with the juniors. Hello, juniors. If there's some of you here, we had fun. I survived. I slept well. <laughs> so that was really great. So we hope you had an Easter blessing. And today we are having communion service as a follow-on just to uh, celebrate that. Uh, there is uh, prayer lunch is on today if you'd like to join the team. Uh, and then next week, instead of Sabbath school, we have Cafe 13. Okay, so... Uh, we all gather together, that's teens, youth and all adult classes will be in the hall for Cafe 13 and that's always a good time and so remember to bring some snacks along so that we can have something yummy to eat while we fellowship together uh, and get to know each other better. And uh, Joe, welcome. Warren Shear's daughter, Joe, is here. I don't know if we've ever met Joe. I know, I know who you are, but it's a rare appearance by Joe from America. So there you go. Good to have you here, uh, among others. And, uh, yeah, she's also the sister of Brad, who's our worship ministry leader and choir leader. And he warned me. He said, hey, my sister's here. I'm like, wow, that's exciting. That's worthy of a mention. So there you go. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, Cafe 13 next week, prayer lunch today, and we hope... For those of you at school, you're enjoying your school holidays, and uh, I'll hand it over to the worship team. Thank you. To kill. 
It was meant to showcase earthly power on the side of a hill. It was wood and rope. It was hammer and nails. It was degradation, then death. And it never failed. It was chosen to stop the Christ, to erase the message he taught. It was the bitter end of Jesus. At least, that's what they thought. It was intended to defeat, to put down, to make the disciples give up, but instead it became the symbol of God's love. The icon of death became the icon of true living. What once marked the end is now the mark of the beginning, a mark of forgiveness, of new life, of new birth. What began at Calvary now covers the earth over cities, over hospitals, through the streets, through homes. The picture of God's sacrifice is our picture of hope, the lasting image of our Savior and salvation's great cost. This is more than a symbol. This is the cross. Morning, church. Can you hear me? Sounds like it's the second day. My name is Olivia, and this is Karen, my daughter. We're just here, really, to welcome you to Sabbath, no, to Sabbath school. Welcome you to church. Hope you feel blessed, and we thank the visitors who are here amongst us. I've seen a few familiar faces. I think Sam and Eve, they were here at camp. Welcome. I can see Sam there. Welcome to Livingston. Karen has something else to say. All right, church, so we've actually placed a few sticky notes under some random chairs, so I'm hoping that they've been evenly dispersed. So if you can look under your chair and see if you have a blue sticky note. If not, maybe look at the chair next to you. <laughs> and if you do, can you please stand up? <laughs> it's like an Easter egg hunt. Or on the floor, is it? If you have a sticky note, stand up. All right. We only got two? No, there's one here, there's one there. What? And if you have more than one, maybe share amongst those around you. So you have one sticky note, if you are holding two. Everyone has one? All right, so if you can um, answer the question, I'll come around, if you don't mind. <laughs> so read what the question is. All right, so um, can you tell me one thing you love about Livingston? love about Livingston. Um, I like that Livingston is so diverse. The people are friendly, diverse from all different um, cultures and that we have a um, good service attitude and, um, and that we're fun loving. Oh, that's perfect. You're an overachiever. All right. <laughs> Guten Morgen, Livingston Church. <laughs> Glückliche Willkommen sind der Kirche heute. So her question was, can you greet the church in another language other than English? So that was German.
Psalms 100 verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anna Sue. Okay, and the last one. Um, I'm grateful today that I was able to come to church and join Sabbath school and that we had a good group in Sabbath school and we were able to discuss things. So I'm assuming your question was... Um, I'm grateful today for, and that's perfect. Thank you. Sorry, the greeting has taken longer than we thought, but happy Sabbath and welcome to church. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to start off. The worship today. If you would all like to stand with us as we can sing our first song, Egypt. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance. The exodus of my heart You found me, you freed me Held back the waters from my release Oh Yahweh You're the God who fights for me The Lord of every victory Hallelujah, hallelujah You have won Bye. 
just want to sort that out. Next song you can see is on screen. It's Holy Water. So continue standing with us as well. We'll, we'll start that in a second. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please, again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet. Sorry, this one was mine. I forgot about this. Um, so we kind of like you'll hear the the other one at the end of the at the end of the service. But this one was also kind of like a one that we'd done before, but we weren't too certain about. And we went, why not give it a go? Let's like work it out. And we were working it out on Thursday night, and it took us a little bit, but eventually we got to the point where we went, no, this is sounding good. Like I don't really think there's anything else that we need to do right now. Um, and then we ran into a few hiccups and then we just kind of went, are we, are we sure that this is what we're meant to be doing? And, um, and then we, we came together this morning and it just went together beautifully. So hopefully we can perfect oh. it again. <laughs> but um, yeah, you're already standing. I was about to ask if you can please stand, but just sing. Just praise the Lord. Oh, 
at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the steeds. Should I ever be reminded how you've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burdens where another died. you. Excellent. Thank you. I'll just get you to remain standing while we just have, and just bow your heads while we, while we have prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come here today to, um, to worship you. We thank you for the, the music that these guys have presented to us and we've been able to, to worship you in song. Now as we um, worship you in prayer, we just want to um, praise you for being such a wonderful, caring, loving God. 
a God that, um, as the music just said, that when we're going through difficulties, when we're going through fiery times, you're there with us. Help us always to remember that um, we're never alone. We can always reach out to you and you're always so willing and so prepared to help us out. And this particular time of the year, we've celebrated Easter at camp and we've had so, been blessed with some really good speakers and some amazing programs there. And we thank you that we're able to come together as a church and be able to worship you in so many different ways there. And today as we um, worship you through our communion service, we are reminded of your wonderful love and sacrifice to each and every one of us. Your willingness to come here and die on the cross and to suffer a criminal's death um, because of your great love for us. Help us always to remember your willingness to suffer and to your willingness to forgive us for our, our sins and help us no, mat no matter what we've done or where we've been that we can always gain forgiveness through you. So we ask that you'll be part of our worship service today, that you will bless um, Pastor Andrew as he speaks to us and that we each one might uh, renew our commitment and love to you and those of us that have perhaps um, made mistakes and sort of feeling a bit um, alone, that no matter what we've done, we can always reach out and you'll always be willing to forgive us. So bless us, uh, each one. And we pray that you might bless the offering that's to be collected, um, which is for, for Hope, which is the, um, the radio program that reaches out to the wider community so that you might use this money in a very wise way. So bless us each one, we pray in your wonderful name. Amen. Um, now it's time for the offering, which is going to Hope Channel. Um, may the deacons please come up. Thank you for giving. This is Hope Channel. A place of trust, of faith, of belief. Where we unpack themes from the Bible. Where we talk about family, health, and love. Where we dive deep into verses from the Word of God with friends. Where we answer questions about life, death, and everything in between. Where you don't have to pray alone. Where you can be encouraged. Where your life can be transformed. Welcome to Hope Channel. Yeah, it's good to give an offering to support the Hope Channel. 80 countries uh, Hope Channel is in. Uh, and yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you to check it out sometime. You can do it most easily on the internet these days. Some people have like the satellite dish, but you can tune in and it's a bit like Foxtel or Netflix. They do have live, but you can also do on demand as well. So you can watch different programs, Australian, American. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Anyway, who is welcome at the table? That's what we're going to consider today. Uh, one of the highlights of Easter camp for us is uh, where we camp in Avenue 7. Uh, Mike and Christy Popkiss, our good mates from Fremantle, organise a big Saturday lunch. We all bring stuff and there's a big, big table with lots of food. And it's certainly a good place to be welcomed. I don't know how many of you heard of this classic film, 1967, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Now, you've got to remember, at the time, America had just gone through the civil rights uh, movement 
And when this came out, uh, they'd only just gotten rid of laws in 13 states that made it illegal for a black person to marry a white person. Amazing, eh? <laughs> and so this film starring uh, Sidney uh, Poitier and uh, Catherine Horton, who was the niece of Catherine Hepburn, and Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy in it as well, if you're into your classic movie stars, uh, they come uh, and surprise both of their parents. And both of their parents are a bit shocked that they're going to uh, get married. And it works through that whole issue and how they come to terms with this guess who's coming to dinner. So who's welcome at the table? It's a question that's been looked at down through the ages. And it's interesting because in Jesus and the apostles' time, there was very rigid social rules about who ate with who. And we see this in an interesting uh, episode that happens when Paul and Peter first meet. So, of course, Peter is one of Jesus' 12 disciples that goes through his whole ministry with him. Uh, Paul is a Johnny-come-lately. He's opposing the Christian church, and then on the road to Damascus, he gets the vision from Jesus, and he becomes a convert. And so Paul in Galatians says, well, I went down and met with the apostles, and James, Peter, and John, who were known as the pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. So he said, when we first met them, they're like, yep, yep, we're happy with what you're doing with your ministry to the Gentiles, and we encourage you. They encourage us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continue their work with the Jews. So everything seems to go well for a while. But then they're up at Antioch. So up there in uh, eastern Turkey and Paul is based there and Peter comes there and then Paul says, I opposed him to his face. What he did was very wrong. You're like, whoa, bit of a fight breaks out between two of the most significant figures in the early Christian church. What is going on? What's the dispute over? Paul says, when Peter first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with them anymore. So the pressure is on because there were rules. This is how they maintained their purity. They, if you were a good Jewish believer, you wouldn't eat with the Gentiles unless they converted to your faith. And so Peter at first is like, oh, well, we don't have to worry about that anymore now that we're in the new Jesus movement. But when some of the more conservative Christian believers come up from Jerusalem who are uncomfortable with this situation, Peter is feeling the heat from there and he says, oh, I won't eat with the Gentiles anymore. And so Paul says, hey, he's afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As, as a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Now, this would have really stung, because Barnabas is the right-hand man of Paul. You know, Barnabas is the guy who sort of set Paul up, and they're a, a really tight-knit team at this period, and Barnabas is starting to waver on this whole issue, and Paul's like, What? What are you doing? We need to make these Gentile people feel included. How could you not eat with them? And so he says, hey, I saw they weren't following the truth of the gospel message. So I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you a Jew by birth have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow these Jewish traditions? So you can see the tension here uh, about who's welcome at the table and who eats with who. And it's interesting, this is a comment by Francis Vellancani, a, uh, a, a Bible scholar, and he says, In the Jewish social world, sharing a meal with others was a sign of intimacy, love, communion, and fellowship. It also meant fellowship before God. It was also considered an anticipation of the Messianic banquet. So in this day and age, no doubt, if you're having a meal, if you're having a party, you may consider who are you going to invite. One of the things we're hoping to run in the near future is a Livingston guess who's coming to lunch. And we're going to uh, you know, have a bit of a surprise package and send someone to your house if you're a host and you don't know who you're going to get. But when, so that could be a fun day. But normally you know, we sort of eat with people we might feel comfortable with, people we know. Uh, but in the Jewish world, it was much deeper than that. It was like, you know, if you're one of us, we eat together. If you're not, we don't. 
It's a sign of intimacy, love, communion, and fellowship. It's a very spiritual thing. The Pharisees engaged themselves only in exclusive meals to observe strict cultic purity. That's cultic as in religious purity in the technical term, not as in running a weird organization, okay? Uh, So the Pharisees, they excluded people. So they say, hey, we only eat with the right people. We exclude anyone we consider as a sinner, anyone who has a dubious moral character, and those who are employed in ritually impure occupations. So if you regularly dealt with animals, animal skins, or bodily fluids, if you're like a nurse or a doctor or something, they were like, we don't really want to eat with you because we might become unclean. And they were not welcome at their table. But right through things, Jesus takes a different tack. This is not how Jesus approaches things. Jesus calls the tax collector Matthew, Levi Matthew, to be his follower. And immediately Matthew says, hey, can we have a dinner? Can we celebrate together? And Jesus says, sure. Not normally the response of a Jewish rabbi, but he says, sure, I'll be there. And they have dinner at Matthew's house. Many tax collectors and sinners come and eat with him. And the Pharisees go, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Like, what are you doing? You're eating with the wrong crowd. Why are these people welcome at your table? Why are you making yourself welcome at their table? And Jesus replies, he's like, hey, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And it's uh, a common mistake that even Christians make today. Because sometimes we go, okay, It'd be good to let people know about Jesus and his love. So but how about we invite them into our space? Like we invite them to come and sit in our church and, and experience what, what we're doing here. And hopefully if people come along, they do find it welcome. But it's still, you know, to initially invite someone to come onto our turf and an unfamiliar space is often uncomfortable for people. And it's much better to go and take christianity initially to their space to where they are but sometimes that's uncomfortable like what if it's a space where people are like eating and drinking things we would normally eat and drink or doing things we wouldn't normally do and we feel uncomfortable about that but that jesus is like no i want to follow god but i want to be with people i want to take god's presence to people where they are because healthy people don't need a doctor sick people to do i've come to call not those who think they are righteous but those who know they are sinners, Matthew chapter 9. And then on another occasion, Jesus totally reframes this whole idea of who gets to sit down at God's table. There's a Roman officer, a centurion, and he comes to Jesus in Capernaum and he says, my servant is sick, will you heal him? And Jesus says, sure, which is an amazing thing in itself. You know, this is like, an officer of the invading oppressors. But he's like, no, 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 putting all that aside, I'm happy to come and heal your servant. And he says, I'll come to your home. And the guy says, hey, you don't have to do that. I'm not worthy of you to come to my house. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. And Jesus is like, wow, I'm amazed at your faith. This is amazing. And he turns around and says, check this guy out. I haven't seen faith like this in all the Israelites. Like this Roman, you know, pagan, as it were, is, has a lot more faith than a lot of you. And then he makes this remarkable statement, Matthew 8, verse 11. Many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. Like, wow. Wow. It'd be like if you turned up in Jerusalem today and said, um, there's going to be a great celebration, but many Palestinians are going to come and do that. Or you went to Gaza and said the opposite. Like that, You probably wouldn't go down too well. This was a radical and surprising, a shocking statement in that context. And just to rub it in with the Gentiles sitting down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob at the Feast of the Kingdom of Heaven, these unexpected guests, he says, and guess what? Many Israelites, for those, whom the, 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 those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness, where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
totally reverses the expectation of who was going to be welcome at God's table. And then he, he, he tells a parable about the great feast as well, this recurring theme, the idea of, you know, when, when the kingdom comes in all its fullness, it's like going to be like a great feast. And he says, hey, it's a bit like a man who prepared a great feast, sent out many invitations, and then the excuses roll in. We've all had this experience, haven't we? Whether it's your own or, you know, your kid's birthday party, everybody's like, ah, I can't make it that time. Can't make it. I'm busy that time. And you're like, what? Someone bought a field that had to inspect it. Another one bought some cows and had to try them out, whatever that means, ride them or something. Uh, another one got married. Sorry, too busy, can't come. And they're like, ugh, the master is furious. So he goes, all right, we've got all this food, we've got this party planned. What are we going to do? Invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame from the streets and the alleyways. That's a good idea. So let's do that. And then in Luke's version, they go, oh, guess what? We've done that and there's still room for more. And the master goes, oh, well, go out into the country lanes behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come. Anyone you find to come. And in Matthew's version, Jesus says, both good and bad. You're like, what the heck? So the house will be full. This is quite a, a radical thing to say. You know, usually if our teenagers organize a party, we go, who's coming? Because you don't want that like open invitation on social media where you end up with like a thousand people on your street and the police and you end up on the news, right? <laughs> We've all seen those news stories and it's not good. <laughs> okay. But this is basically what Jesus is pitching in, the, in, this, uh, in this parable. This, he's saying the kingdom is like this, that I want the house to be full. I want er, all the seats to be taken. So basically, open those doors super wide. Anyone is welcome at the table. It was a cr totally cross-cultural concept. Because not only were there religious things going on in their society, there were class distinctions. Like if you're a rich person, you didn't eat with the poor people. If you're a master... In Roman society, you didn't socialize with the slaves. They were your servants. And if you're a man, you were considered a cut above the women and the children. And this was all going on. And, and Jesus launches a revolution and says, no, no, no. Away with all that. Everyone is welcome at the table. Jesus and his followers completely upend the whole system, the rules of table fellowship. Barriers of race, religion, class, age, and gender come crashing down. And everyone is welcome at the table. And it climaxes with the experience of Peter in Acts because he's called to go and minister to Cornelius up there at Caesarea, uh, who is a man that's interested in God, but he's a Gentile. And, and God sends him that weird vision full of unclean food. And he says, eat it. And he's like, I don't want to eat that. And, he, and God's like, eat it. And then when he wakes up and this happens, he goes, ah, it's not that God was wanting me to suddenly chow down on all those like snakes and bugs and stuff. <laughs> He's trying to tell me something about people. It, it's like it's symbolic. And so when he gets called to the house of Cornelius, he goes and he says, you know what? You know Cornelius. It's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or even associate with you. But God has shown me I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. And the Christian revolution suddenly takes off like wildfire because suddenly you don't have to cross, you know, these ethnic barriers. You don't have to cross these class barriers. Suddenly anybody is welcome at the table if they have faith in Jesus Christ. I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism and every nation accepts those who fear him and do what is right. And it's interesting because um, when we come back and consider Jesus' death on the cross, it really is an insight into how important every person is. And it doesn't matter if you're young or old, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, man or woman, rich or poor, whatever your category is, Jesus is trying to say, you are important, you are welcome at the table. 
Paul says in Colossians, hey, when we were dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of our flesh, God made us alive with Christ. He forgave us our sins. He cancelled any charge against us in a legal sense, which stood against us and condemned us. He took it away and nailed it to the cross. And then he says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, having disarmed the spiritual forces of evil that were against us, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Again, this is totally reversing things because as we sort of heard, if you were listening to our video at the beginning, the cross was designed as an instrument of power and humiliation. It was a way of saying, don't mess with the Roman Empire. Don't mess with Caesar. If you do, we will kill you slowly and painfully. We will not only kill you, we will humiliate you. And the Romans uh, were very big into this. It's estimated that when Julius Caesar conquered uh, Gaul, which is where France is now, he killed a million Gauls and enslaved a million others. And they would have these huge triumphal parades where they would come back to Rome and they would lead the prisoners of war and lead uh, all the, the, the booty and all the loot that they had got. And, and they would say, look at us, our triumph. So usually if someone died on a cross, they were the lowest of the low. But Paul says, no, actually... If Jesus is the Son of God and the resurrected Son of God, then the cross is not the point of humiliation. The cross is the point of triumph. And what that means, if the man dying on the cross is the Son of God, then everyone's important. Because the victims and the vulnerable are just important as the powerful. That's the incredible message of Christianity. If the Son of God himself can be a victim and the most vulnerable, then anybody in that situation is just as important as the most powerful. So not only the powerful and the privileged get to sit at the table, all are welcome. That's the message of the cross itself. And so this incredible statement, coming back to Galatians, we are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. There's no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. He's saying, it's no longer that you have to be a Jew. God's promises is wider than that. It's no longer that you have to be powerful, or you have to be male, or you have to be a certain ethnicity. God's promises is wider than that. God is doing something cross-culturally god is doing something cross genders he's doing something on all levels of society and all should gather at the table as equals because god loves all of us and the implications of this are th three things you can probably think of more but the three things that struck me as i looked at all this number one everyone is important to god everybody because we can say that, but then we meet some people and you go, oh, they're a bit second class. They're a bit smelly. They're a bit dirty. Their life is a bit messy. They don't do things the way I like. They're a bit hopeless. And maybe they are, but they're still important to God. Everyone is welcome at the table. And number three, number two, sorry, Christians should be as inclusive as possible despite our diversity and our differences. We should be as inclusive as possible, despite our diversity and our differences. We shouldn't exclude people because of our preferences, because of culture, because of gender, because of ethnicity, because of social class, because of whatever. Now, this is an ongoing discussion about how far that goes. Because, you know, it does say in the New Testament, we still have to follow God. You know, we're like what Peter said. You know, God doesn't show favoritism, but he, we still have to, you know, be right with him. So there are still some patterns of 
behavior and some ways of living that go against the kingdom of God. But nonetheless, let's be as inclusive as possible rather than being as exclusive as possible. The the mistake that the Pharisees made in trying to be righteous, they were exclusive. And Jesus said, no, 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 actually, true righteousness, when you understand the love of God, is being as inclusive as possible, is inviting as many people as possible to come and be at the table. And even internally, it's very easy to go, oh, well, they're more traditional or they're more liberal or, you know, they do things this way or they think this is okay, you know, or they're they're comfortable doing that, but I'm comfortable doing this. And it's very easy to get tribal. Have you noticed that? We see this around the world. Like when we're in Perth, we're like, ah, you're north of the river and I'm south of the river. Or you're an Eagles fan, I'm a Dockers fan or whatever. But then if you go over east, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. we're all West Australians. But, you know, you Eastern state is... But then if you go overseas, you're like, oh, no, 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 we're all Australians, you know. We're, you know? <laughs> it's easy wherever you are to sort of break yourself down into the smallest possible tribe and go, well, I'm the in crowd and you're the out crowd. And it's, good to be, it's okay to be sort of proud of who you are and where you are, but be as inclusive as possible. That's uh, what Jesus said, because everyone's welcome at the table. And so let's welcome everybody to God's table. And as we literally gather around our table today, as best we can on this big scale, as we gather around the communion table, remember, everybody is welcome. You are welcome at God's table. Because there's always people that go, yeah, but what about... (laughs) I know you're saying that, but uh, uh, not me. Oh, not that fella, not that lady. That the message is, because Jesus died for you, he sorted out whatever those problems are. Just come to him and feel welcome at his table. And today is the day as we wash feet, as we have bread, as we have wine, that we say, yes. Jesus, thank you for inviting me to part of the, be part of this revolution, to be part of this movement and, and, and to feel welcome at your table. And if we really want to embrace being welcome at God's table, then we not only need to feel the acceptance for us here today, but we need to go out this week and keep living that acceptance to others and making other people feel welcome and included and part of the family of God. All right, we have the opportunity now to do some foot washing for those who would like to, following in Jesus' footsteps. Men, you're in the Adra room off the hall. Ladies, in the seminar room next to the kitchen. And any couples that want to do it together in the small hall where the youth meet, out off the main hall. Uh, There will be a a children's story here for children that stay behind. Your children are welcome to come out to the foot washing, but if you don't want to, there'll be a kid's story here. And we would encourage you to hang around even if you don't join in the foot washing so that when we come back, we can sing a song together and have bread and wine and celebrate being part and welcome of God's table. God bless you. Thanks. Come on down, kids. Just when all hope seemed lost, love opened the door for us. He said, Come to the table, come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down. Set free, come to the table. Come meet this motley crew of misfits, 
these liars and these thieves There's no one unwelcome here And that sin and shame that you brought with you You can leave it at the door And let mercy draw you Would, would all the kids like to come down to the front and we've got a, a special movie to play for you. So you can all come and have a seat down here. And then after the movie, there's a colouring sheet. It was time for Jesus and his disciples to celebrate the Passover. Passover? What is Passover? Do you remember when God sent Moses to rescue the Israelites from Egypt? Oh, yes. God sent frogs and flies and darkness and other things. It was pretty crazy. It was. God sent plague after plague. Ten plagues. But Pharaoh still refused to let God's people go. He said, No, I will not let God's people go. So it was time for Pharaoh to see just how powerful God can be. What happened next? God told Moses to have every Israelite family prepare a lamb for a special meal and then take some of the blood from that lamb and put it over the door of their houses. Why would God tell them to do that? Because for the last plague, God would send an angel to take the life of every firstborn son of the Egyptians. The angel would pass over the homes of the Israelites who had the blood of the lamb over their doors. So the blood of the lamb saved the sons of the Israelites. And ever since that day, the Israelites have celebrated Passover with a special meal, just like the one they had that night in Egypt when the angel passed over their homes many, many years earlier. I get it now. So, Jesus and his disciples traveled to Jerusalem where many people gathered to celebrate Passover and something very wonderful happened when he got there. Oh, really? What? As Jesus rode into the city on a donkey, a big crowd of people came to meet him. They knew who he was? Yes, they were so excited. They waved palm branches and then laid them down in front of him. That's funny. What did they do that for? It was their way of honoring Jesus. Like a welcome mat. That's so cool. And then they shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was like a parade. A parade for a king. Everyone was so happy. Wait! 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 Stop everything! We're not happy at all. Not one teeny bit. Ah, yes, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Those religious leaders weren't happy. They were very nervous. Hey! Jesus is such a troublemaker. If the Romans hear people calling him king, they will send their soldiers to throw us in prison. We need to stop Jesus and his followers. So they came up with a secret plan to hurt Jesus. Oh no, they can't hurt Jesus. Don't worry, even this was part of God's plan. Later that night, Jesus and his disciples got together to eat the Passover meal, just like they did every year. But this year was different. During the meal, 
Jesus got up and washed his disciples' feet to show them what it really means to love and serve others. Then, Jesus said something that surprised them all. One of you is going to turn against me. Oh no! Why did he say that? Uh, he knew that one of them was helping the Pharisees and Sadducees. <gasps> Were the disciples surprised? For sure. They looked at each other and said, Who could it be? Jesus knew what was going to happen. He wanted to prepare his followers. So he took a piece of bread and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Then he picked up his cup and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, poured out for you. What did he mean by that? What does cov... cov... Covenant. What does that mean? A covenant is a promise. Many years before, God had made a covenant, a promise, to bless his people. Now, Jesus was saying that God was going to make a new covenant with them. He was going to bless them in a new way. But when he said, This is my body, this is my blood, it sounded like this new covenant had something to do with Jesus dying. And it did. What do you mean? Why would Jesus have to die? Remember when the angel in Egypt saw the blood of the lamb over the door? What did he do? Um, he passed over the house. And the people were safe. Jesus was saying that now his body and blood would save them. He was saying that he was the new Passover lamb. Whoa! The disciples could not believe their ears. Then, after dinner, Jesus took some of his disciples and went to a garden to pray. He knew what he had to do next, and he knew it was not going to be easy. After a while, he said, The hour has come. And just at that moment, one of his disciples arrived, leading a group of soldiers sent by the Sadducees to arrest Jesus. Which disciple was it? The disciple named Judas. Now, everyone knew who had turned against Jesus. With the help of Judas, the Pharisees and Sadducees arrested Jesus. <gasps> just like they planned. But you know what? Things did not go the way they planned. Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father in heaven, lead us not in Temptation, God deliver us from the enemy. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. each moment all that we need to give us our sin as we forgive the ones who have sinned against us Ooh, our father in heaven 
To the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princes, all who fail, we've been forgiven, all who dream and all who suffer, all who loved and lost another, all the chain and all the free, all who follow. to the table We all start on the outside The outside looking in 
This is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we were put in. And it's just when all hope is swimming lost. So Reese has given me what he's written. Um, okay, <laughs> not everyone is welcome at everyone's table. But when you enter his house, he kneels down and washes your feet. He leaves your past at the door and he welcomes you into his love because all are welcome at the Father's table. Please sing with us. Yeah, stand as well, Reese, if you, <laughs> if you would like to. Yeah, thank you. not the end game the journey's where you are never wanted perfect just wanted my heart there's a story isn't over if the story isn't good cause failure's never final when the father's in the room failure's never final when the father's in
Please be seated. It's a beautiful song. It's good to be welcomed. As we've been reflecting today, Jesus made every effort to welcome people to the table, even to the point of washing their feet. So we just want to spend a little bit of time in reflection and prayer, and then we're going to... Uh, have the emblems. Um, <clears throat> just before we, um, we have a time of prayer and, and partake of these symbols, I just want us to um, perhaps spend a little time in contemplation of, um, of what we're doing. And, um, you know, sometimes the, the meaning can be lost and we, we have the symbols but without the meaning. So I just want to think of um personally what this means for each one of us the jesus body broken for us and his blood poured out in sacrifice for our sins i want us to to um just stop and think of the reality of that promise that our sins are forgiven and we can come into the presence of god guilt free because of jesus i want us to think of that as we receive these symbols and and think of the um the personal application of that, it's personal for you. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died knowing specifically your failures and your sins and out of love he took them and died for you. So I want you to think of that and then in, in response to that love and the grace that he's shown you, I want us to think about those starting here in our church family and think of the times perhaps we haven't shown the same grace that God has shown us and in the time of reflection to to pray for forgiveness and if necessary find that person or persons that you have um, spoken ill of maybe or, or wronged in some way and um, and repent and also pray that you can forgive those who you need to forgive that we would know fully the the blessing that jesus gave for us not just in receiving forgiveness but in giving it too so just think of those things i'm going to pray now um, and i want you to to pray in your mind loving father so often we um we forget and you said remember the reason we're doing this is to remember and we're to keep near to keep doing it because we keep forgetting we forget the meaning of what we're doing and we forget that Jesus is real and he really died for my sins and I know I really need that and we all do. Help us, each one here, no one to leave today carrying their burdens that they came with but to trust that 
your gift is for them personally, that their sins are forgiven, not because of any work they've done or any worthiness on their behalf, but because you love each one of us and you want to make a way for each of us to be at your table, to be in the presence of God the Father, um, cleansed of guilt. And please help us each to, to purpose in our hearts to forgive what needs to be forgiven and to repent of what needs to be repented of so that the prayer that Jesus prayed that we would be one, one with you and one with each other would be fulfilled. I ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, I also uh, pray with my friends here today and thank you that you are a welcoming and a forgiving and a cleansing God. And we desire to gather at your table because it's a place of healing. It's a place of peace. It's a place of love. So, yeah, today we do pray that we will receive your grace and we pray that in doing so, as Sean's been reflecting, that we too might be gracious, that just as we are forgiven, we might be forgiving. Just as we are loved, we might be loving. As we uh, commune with you, remembering your sacrifice, remembering your broken body and your spilt blood, May it continue to change our hearts and make us instruments of your peace in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Sorry, if you're old enough to believe in Jesus' sacrifice for you, you're welcome to, to participate today. Uh, and if you are gluten-free, uh, put your hand up. And Leonie, maybe you can take that one, and she will come and attend to you. Thank you.
the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, thank you that we can come to you through Jesus, who has given us the Spirit. Today, we are so glad to be welcome at your table. May we go from here, offering love and service to the world as you did, that we may welcome others into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be privileged with a special song from Mahadi and her friends to Climax today. Uh, the deacons will collect your cups as that happens. And thank you, Mahadi and friends, for leading us in this song.
Amen. Thanks to all those who made today possible, deacons, deaconesses, uh, Sean, our band, our worship team, worship coordinators, tech crew, a lot of moving parts today, but it's been a blessing. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.